Okay, in this process, or process, idiot. In this video, we are going to, um, uh, sorry, I've been going at it since working since about four in the morning, taught three classes today, and now I'm home recording videos. So if I get a little weird or loopy, that's why. Um, so basically, in this video, we are going to talk about the process of gas exchange and essentially how concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, change during the process of respiration. Because remember that term respiration is, remember there's a difference between ventilation and respiration. Ventilation, simply put, is just the movement of air, all right? And we move, and when we ventilate air, when we, through inhaling and exhaling, and we've already covered the mechanical processes behind that, but basically when we inhale, we bring air in, and then when we exhale, we bring air out. That's all ventilation is. Whereas respiration, is a process that occurs in the alveolar air sacs of the lungs. Respiration is the diffusion of gases across cell membranes. And the, and the cell membranes in particular here would be the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, okay? Um, so that's kind of something to keep in mind. So basically what we'll do is we'll talk about the concept of partial pressure. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the concept of partial pressure and then uh, basically what creates it, how partial pressure can change, and then we'll essentially talk about how the concentration or the content, or I should you know if I want to keep it proper, how the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide essentially change as we circulate blood throughout the body. Okay, so that's essentially what we are going to cover here. Partial pressure is essentially a, basically I like to think of it as a concentration gradient. All right, um, partial, so basically partial, in order for there to actually be a pressure, there has to be a presence. All right, so basically if we go to sea level and we measure the composition of the air at sea level, and we and we add up the we add up the composition of all the gases in sea level, and basically we uh, you know if we took a you know if we took a glass tube, filled it up with mercury, okay, and then basically um, measured how the air would exert pressure on that mercury, the composition of all those gases would essentially displace that mercury 760 millimeters, okay. That is what we refer to as one atmosphere of air at sea level. Now, you now basically, what do you think is going to happen then if we move below sea level? All right. Obviously, the lower we go, the higher the concentration of gases putting force on us. You know, like if you go deep sea diving or whatnot, that's going to increase the pressures of gases, and vice versa. When you go higher in altitude, and the concentration of gases in the air decreases partial pressure is going to essentially drop, you know, atmospheric pressure, partial pressure of gases, and so on, okay? So uh, that's what I meant, atmospheric pressure, I'm sorry. So, however, if atmospheric pressure drops, the partial pressure of gases will drop along with it. Because essentially what partial pressure is, it's, it's concentration, okay? Like I said, in order for gases to actually exert pressure on something, there has to be a presence of gases. They have to be there, all right? Um... And when we look at atmospheric air on Earth, you know, the, the most abundant gas in the air is nitrogen, okay? About 78, 77, 78, 76, depending on what book you read. Um, but, you know, get, get right around this range of uh, basically uh, air is uh, nitrogen, you know, so close. So more than three quarters of air is nitrogen gas, okay? And then the next most abundant gas is going to be oxygen. And notice when you take a look at just nitrogen and oxygen, that is that makes up almost all of the, uh, basically all the total composition of atmospheric air. And then there's a mixture of others, you know, like argon, you know, less than a, less than a percent of carbon dioxide, and then various other gases. And basically, when we add that up, that again comes out to 760 millimeters of mercury of atmospheric pressure. Now. Uh, so basically, so that probably was a mouthful or earful or was confusing, but basically what, what we're saying, now one thing we have to think about then is we have to basically remember, I, I can't say this enough, just think of partial pressure as a concentration, right? And, base, and you understand, I mean, how gases move around anyway, when, when 
uh, what, remember the process of gas exchange itself is essentially the process of simple diffusion, right? It's the process of simple diffusion. So when we want to exchange gases between blood and air that we breathe in, if we want oxygen to go into the blood, there obviously has to be a higher amount of oxygen in the air that we breathe in versus blood that's flowing, you know, through the through the pulmonary capillaries. All right, simple diffusion, right? Because remember, remember molecules, you know, whether it's gas or any kind of molecule, you know, the molecules are always in motion; they're always moving around. So if we um, so, and then vice versa with carbon dioxide, all right, so if we've got, you know, 40, uh, partial pressure of 45 in the, uh, what you might call it, the blood, and then a partial pressure of 40 in the air that we breathe in, that's going to force carbon dioxide out. Because remember, remember how diffusion works, right? We have, you know, diffusion's all about the motion of molecules, right? And if there are more molecules moving around on one side of a membrane than the other, you'll have a net movement more in what more on one side. Okay, that's essentially how this works. But like I said, there has to be an actual presence of these gases. All right. Um, and one thing to remember about gases when you're thinking about the composition of air and what air and whatnot, uh, you know, the, the, you always talk about Dalton's law. So basically, all these gases, even though air is made up of a handful of different gases. All of these gases behave like they're the only gas in the air. Okay, so they all have their own individual properties. Um, so that's kind of something to keep in mind. All right. Um, so that's why basically, so when you take all these gases and add them up individually, you get you get the total composition, and that is one atmosphere of air. Okay. Now, there's some things that we have to think about here. Then, uh, when we're thinking about how these gases essentially behave. Uh, well, first off, before we even do that, let's uh, let's let's kind of let's think about how how different atmospheric air is compared to air in the alveolar air sacs. Okay, air in the atmosphere, for starters, the humidity is going to vary. Okay, so where would you see variability in humidity? Where would you see variability in humidity? Uh, well, for example, tonight it's raining, it's foggy, it's really you know wet outside. You know, in the in the well, at least in you know uh, South Central Kentucky right now. Um, whereas if I probably went down to I don't know the southwestern United States where it's all desert, there'd be almost no humidity in the air down there. All right. Whereas when you go to the you know whereas where you go you know maybe to the ocean and you're you know you're you're you're, you're around there. Uh, you know, up to maybe 4% of the composition of air could be, you know, could be water, all right? So that's something to kind of keep in mind is that humidity can, humidity fluctuates depending on where you're at and the seasons and whatnot. You know, for example, if you're, you know, again, I grew up in northern Wisconsin and, you know, where it's, where temperatures reach well, you know, well below zero, uh, zero degrees, you know, both Fahrenheit and Celsius, and um, and when it gets to sub-zero temperatures, it's so cold that water just condenses on the ground and it doesn't really evaporate very well. So the air is really cold, really dry. All right. So so basically, humidity can fluctuate depending on where you're at and what season it is. All right. Air that we breathe in has uh, basically has a lot of oxygen. Now let's think about this for a second. So basically. We, we essentially said that 20% of, of air is, uh, is composed of uh, oxygen in its you know, gaseous state. And we said that when we add up the total of all the gases in the air, the one atmosphere of air, that comes out to about um, 760 millimeters of mercury, right? Okay, so, so basically 20% of that, so 760... Equals give or take. I'm rounding down a little bit, but basically, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air, in atmospheric air, is going to be 150 millimeters of mercury. So basically, what I just said here is that just just by the total composition of oxygen in the air, it's going to exert. Th this is how much pressure oxygen is is creating or exerting in the air that that we're breathing in. Okay. Um, and something to think about as well is that, you know, like I said, um, 
excuse me, I mean, you know, less than a, you know, le less than a percent of, so let's say if we just take 760 times 0.05, um, so basically the partial pressure of, uh, of carbon dioxide in the air is going to be right around 40 millimeters of mercury, okay, so you can see significantly lower. So right now, you're probably already thinking that, okay, well, there's a lot more oxygen in the air. Uh, oxygen is going to diffuse a lot more easily, so gas exchange is a lot more easier here. There's another factor we haven't talked about yet, and that is that is basically the effect of the, the, the presence of gases in water. I'll talk about that in a second. But alveolar air, the air, remember, remember that we've got a residual volume of air in our alveolar air sacs. There's always a volume of air left inside. And so, so basically, it takes a lot of breath for us to completely recycle that air in the alveoli. So, so remember what we do to air as we breathe it in. We filter it, we warm it, and we humidify it. Okay, Air in the alveolar air sacs is going to be at 100% humidity. Okay, It's going to be 100% humid in the alveoli. Now, that's a key thing here because that is essentially going to affect... You know, the, the, that's going to essentially affect the process of gas exchange, which I'll talk about in a second. There's a lot more carbon dioxide, well, not a lot more, but there's more carbon dioxide in, um, basically, in, in the alveolar air sacs versus atmospheric air. Because remember, as we're circulating blood, as we're circulating blood by the alveolar, you know, as blood is passing by alveoli, okay, we are constantly removing carbon dioxide from blood, okay? So there's always going to be, so basically there's going to be, um, you know, more CO2 here. And there's going to be less oxygen as well. So basically, as oxygen travels, as air travels down the conducting airways, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to drop, all right? And a big part of that is the presence of water, okay? Is the presence of water. Um... And, you know, there may be some cells along the way that will grab a little bit of oxygen, but most of it has to do with the humidity factor. And that essentially is what we refer to as Henry's Law. So basically, um, so basically the behaviors of gases uh, are affected by a couple of different things. Uh, or essentially how gases diffuse across membranes uh, depend on a couple of big factors. The temperature of the fluid, uh, or, you know, the, the temperature of the fluid where exchange is occurring. Uh, and, and these two are the big ones, the solubility, solubility of these gases and uh, the partial pressure. And remember, partial pressure is, we're just going to, I'm just going to abbreviate this PP after I write the whole word out anyway. Partial pressure, remember, is just concentration, all right, the presence of those gases creating some kind of creating pressure, okay? Now, um, so basically, uh, one thing to remember about, so let's talk about the solubility factor here for a second. Carbon dioxide is way more soluble in water um, than oxygen. Okay, O2, not so much. Okay, oxygen is not nearly as soluble in water as carbon dioxide, okay? So, basically, as air is traveling down, as ba basically as air is traveling down the conducting airways and towards the alveoli, they're becoming humidified. As we collect all that humidity, because remember, we're grabbing water, water vapor, water droplets from the mucous membranes, that essentially is going to, uh, basically it's going to dilute the amount of oxygen in that air and it's going to make it, and we're not going to be able to grab as much oxygen out of that air that we essentially need to. So that's why the partial pressure essentially drops from 150 to 100 by the time air, number of millimeters of mercury, by the time air reaches the alveolar air sacs. Okay, so remember that. Uh, the solubility factor, whereas the partial pressure of carbon dioxide remains relatively unchanged because it just mixes in water so easily. Um, and that's something to think about as well, is that if we wanted these gases to equilibrate, uh, you know, reach an equilibrium in fluid between, you know, basically reach an equilibrium in, in concentrations in, in fluids versus air, okay, in fluids versus air, all right, you know, 
when it there that that's going to this this solubility factor is going to is it greatly affects this process now because co2 is more highly soluble meaning it mixes with water a lot more easily that means that it's a lot easier for carbon dioxide to reach an equilibrium in water versus you know in, between water and air it just requires less because it mixes so well whereas in order to reach an equilibrium between atmospheric air and and water it's going to require a lot more oxygen to to mix in that water to reach that that's why when we when we take a look at these values here in a second when we talk about circulating blood all right th past alveolar air sacs that's why when we breathe air in you know the the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of oxygen in blood flowing through the pulmonary capillaries, at least entering the pulmonary capillaries, is at 40 millimeters of mercury. So in order to have this process of diffusion occur, there needs to be a much greater concentration gradient, a much greater difference, so we can have more motion taking place to equilibrate. All right, whereas, when, whereas you notice the numbers I used with CO2 earlier, 45 in the blood, 40 in the air, because carbon dioxide can is is very soluble, it mixes well with water. All right, it's going to move across these membranes a lot more easily. All right, so it's going to equilibrate a lot more a lot more easily or more quickly just because it mixes in water. And I mean that, and you know that's and, and in saying that, that's how, for example, carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, like when you drink a carbonated beverage, what they essentially do with that, whether it's a uh, you know whether it's a soda or it's a tasty beer. Um, uh, cheers. Basically, uh, what they do with that is they um, basically they, they take a bunch of carbon dioxide and they just over you know that 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 liquid in that can is oversaturated. And then what happens is that you know obviously the, 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 it's that carbon dioxide you know they add pressure to that force the CO two in, and then they seal off the can or the bottle you know if they're bottling it. And then what happens? You know, so basically, then that carbon dioxide oversaturates that liquid, and just but it's but it's dissolved in that liquid, and then what happened? That that's why you know when you're making you know beer or soda, there you can run the risk of overcarbonating or undercarbonating, and but 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 regardless, you know if you do it right, that that water is going to be very saturated with CO two, and it's going to be tightly sealed in there. That's why the second you remove the you know when you pop the tap on the can or remove the the top of the uh, you know the bottle cap. That's why you hear that psh sound because now you relieve the pressure that's holding that CO2 in the fluid and then carbon dioxide starts to rush out of there. Basically that carbon dioxide is, is trying to equilibrate because there's a lot more CO2 in that water than there needs to be. And then that's why if you just leave the, 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 the beverage sip for too long, it's going to flatten out because it's going to reach its equilibrium, and but there's not going to be a whole lot. You'll see a few bubbles left, but there won't be a whole lot of CO2 left in the liquid. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. All right. Now, so in saying that, in saying that then, so, so, uh, so, so in saying that, let's kind of move into the, and, and discuss then, apply all of that stuff to the process of respiration. Remember, respiration is the process of gas exchange. And when we're talking about, you know, human physiology, I mean, most, you know, animal physiology, Basically, we think of respiration uh, occurring in two forms, internal and external, okay? Internal and external respiration. External respiration is respiration that occurs between air and blood, more specifically atmospheric air and blood. Internal respiration is respiration that occurs between blood and tissues, more specifically interstitial fluid in the tissues. Okay, but remember the concept of respiration, it's the it's gas exchange across cell membranes. All right. Um, now, basically this is a now this is always described as being a function of the respiratory system, but realistically, if you look at this process for what it is, it's a culmination of it's a combination of the functions of the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system because it doesn't do us any good. If we could remember in the previous video when we talked about lung volumes, it doesn't do us any good if we can't actually circulate the blood around if there, we have cardiovascular complications. And if we have pulmonary complications, it's going to be hard to equilibrate or resaturate or you know our blood with oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. 
Okay, so that's something you kind of have to keep in mind is that this is a combination of both of these. And when we say that, now these expressions oxygenated and deoxygenated, when we say our blood is oxygenated, basically, basically what we're saying here is that it's more highly saturated with oxygen. Under normal conditions, it's never 100%. Right? It's never 100% saturated with oxygen, essentially because, um, you know, because we've got the Thavesian veins draining venous blood directly into the left and right ventricles, and basically the uh, blood that drains from the bronchioles and the lungs essentially drains directly into the left atrium and mixes, it's just a little bit, but it mixes with that, um, with that highly oxygenated blood in the, uh, in the left ventricle. Thus, you know, so when blood, so when blood essentially you know, run, escapes pulmonary capillaries, it's at 100%, but by the time that blood gets to the, you know, leaves the left ventricle, it has mixed a little bit with deoxygenated blood and is at 98% saturation, okay? Um, and when we say deoxygenated, now don't, no, no, be careful with that term because um, it, the blood is not completely deoxygenated when we unload it, and when we unload oxygen in our tissues. We only unload about 22% of oxygen, um, you know, from our hemoglobin on red blood cells into, uh, what was I going to say, into uh, into the tissues, all right? So that's kind of something to keep in mind is that deoxygenation isn't the complete release of oxygen, it's just a certain percent, all right? So it's realistically, it's partial deoxygenation if you want to be specific. So, so that's something to think about then is that blood in the arteries is 98% saturated with oxygen. So basically what we're saying is that hemoglobin is 98% saturated with oxygen. And then blood in the veins is about 76, 75% saturated with oxygen. All right. Now that's something that that's something to, to, to think about because in the, in the next video when I talk about the uh, how we specifically circulate gases, um, you know, basically now, now that's a nice useful feature because this uh, this essentially acts as a as a reserve, all right, as an ox as a, as an O2 reserve, all right. So basically, uh, you know, basically this is the amount we only need to unload 22% of the oxygen that's on our hemoglobin. Because that's all we need to keep our keep ourselves alive, all right. However, when demand increases for oxygen, like during exercise then we are going to unload more. And in the next video, I'll talk more about that unloading process. I don't want to get to that now yet, but that's just something to think about. I'll revisit these concepts in the next video. However, the key factor here is that in order for gas exchange, in order for respiration to occur, there has to be a differences in partial pressures where the gas exchange is occurring. So if we're talking about external respiration, there has to be a difference in the concentration of uh, oxygen and CO2 in the air versus the blood, okay? And then vice versa when we're talking about blood and then and then tissues, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at my third grade art here and, uh, and then talk about this process. So basically, this is going to represent the pulmonary circuit. circuit and then this is going to represent the systemic circuit that's why I drew this a little bigger it wasn't just because my art is that bad it's because um, it's because you know the systemic circuit is a much larger circuit we're talking about pumping blood to all other body systems aside from the uh, you know the lungs themselves so uh, so now let's think about this then so let's think about the, the, the about oxygen so we breathe air in, and when we're talking about this, we're going to use the expression PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen, okay? The, you know, essentially the presence of oxygen. So remember that uh, by the time air reaches the alveolar air sacs, uh, the PO2 in the alveoli is going to be about 100, right? It's going to be about 100. And by the time blood reaches the pulmonary capillaries, the PO2 is going to be about 40. Okay, it's going to be about 40. All right. Now, so so let's kind of think about this here. That is a big difference in the concentration gradient. Okay, that is a big difference in the concentration gradient there. So what's causing this? What's going on here? 
Um, so for starters, why is the PO2 so low in the blood when it gets back to the lungs? Well, you guys know this. I mean, we, we've talked about this before. By the time you got to this, you, you've learned a lot about this. I mean, you guys know that there's just more oxygen in arterial blood than venous blood. And when we pump blood in through, in, you know, out into the body, out into the systemic circuit and blood travels through capillaries, we unload that blood and deliver it to the tissues. So obviously, by the, as that, by the time that blood goes through the veins and returns back to the lungs, it's just less saturated with oxygen. There's less oxygen. And remember, it's only 70, you know, about 76% saturated versus the 98%. So, so, the, so the partial pressure of oxygen is just lower in the pulmonary, as it enters the pulmonary capillaries, just because of the unloading process uh, in the systemic circuit. All right. And so therefore... We by having this higher by having this higher difference, the, the, this concentration gradient, this allows for the diffusion of oxygen from the alveolar air sacs into the blood, and that's how we essentially saturate our, um, basically how we saturate our blood with oxygen. Well, not completely, but you get the picture. And then that blood is eventually going to return back to the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then get pumped out into the systemic circuit. So the PO2 of blood in the arteries, uh, you know, as the, the arteries dispersing through the systemic circuit is going to be 100, or, you know, more specifically, 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So now what's eventually going to happen is this blood, this arterial blood is going to travel through arteries, arterioles, meta-arterioles, and then into capillary beds. Now, let's say this, this circle here represents tissues, okay, or more specifically, interstitial fluid in the tissues. Now, let's, let's review here. Capillaries. Remember, capillaries are the exchange vessels, right? They're porous vessels. They leak out fluids, carry out gases and nutrients with them, and vice versa, reabsorb back in. Now, Remember that cells are no more than about two of their own diameters or more or their widths away. They're really, really close. Okay. Now I'll tell you right now, the PO2 of tissue fluids or of interstitial fluids is going to be about 40. Okay, remember, remember when I use these numbers, we're saying we're talking about millimeters of mercury, right? And then so now so we've got this arterial blood of 100 millimeters of mercury circulating in the capillary beds, well, the process is just going to remain the same here. So that's going to, that's going to favor the diffusion of blood or of oxygen from blood into tissues. So the question is, why is that PO2 so low or a lot lower in the tissues? Well, you guys know this. The answer is the cells. All right, the cells are constantly, I mean, the second that oxygen gets into the tissue fluids, these cells are just gobbling it up and using it for metabolic purposes. They're burning it up, right? They're, they're burning up that oxygen, and then, that, and then that, that's essentially what keeps the partial pressure of oxygen lower in the tissues environments. Now, let's think about this here for a second. So if the PO2 of tissues is 40, what do you think the, what do you think the partial, what, what, what does the partial pressure of cells have to be? What would happen if the partial pressure of oxygen, what, was it, what would happen if the PO2 of oxygen in cells was also 40? We would be able to deliver oxygen into the tissues, but the cells wouldn't be able to take it in. So that would be obviously a useless scenario. So since cells are consuming and spending and using that oxygen, their PO2 is going to be lower than the tissue fluids, you know, down around, you know, 20 or less. Okay, so that will favor the, the diffusion of oxygen through the cell membrane in the cells, and then they'll burn it up. Okay, and then basically as that, as that oxygen was unloaded, right, remember 22% of that oxygen was unloaded, and essentially that is going to, um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, of the hemoglobin is going to be unloaded, that's essentially going to drop the PO2 to 40, Okay. Now let's think about that because I mean look at the blood and arteries. Remember when you when oxygen combines with hemoglobin that that that, that makes hemoglobin a brighter red color, and then as hemoglobin becomes less oxygenated, that's going to make it a more duller red color. So that's kind of something to keep in mind. All right. 
So that's essentially how carbon dioxide levels change throughout the, uh, basically throughout the throughout the circulation. Now let's think about uh, um, let's put mine here. Let's think about carbon dioxide then. Let's think about carbon dioxide. So we said that the again this is going to be pulmonary, and this is going to be systemic. Okay. So as we breathe air in. All right. At, you know, so remember the 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 PO2 of of carbon dioxide is essentially going to be 40. All right, it's going to be 40. All right, versus the PO2 of blood as it enters pulmonary capillaries. Uh, I keep saying PO2. I'm sorry, the PCO2. All right, sorry, PCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide then in blood as it enters pulmonary capillaries is going to be 45. And again, you guys know this. Why is it higher? Right? Why is it why is it higher here? Uh, you know, basically because well, as cells, uh, as you, you guys know this, that as we as we circulate blood through capillary beds, we grab carbon dioxide out of tissues and then we circulate it back to the we circulate it to the lungs and then we we get rid of it there, right? And so basically, in order for us to be able to get rid of that, we have to have the partial pressure of carbon dioxide higher than that of the air that we breathe in. Now, remember that, now obviously this isn't that big of a difference in concentration, but remember, since carbon dioxide is, is a lot more soluble in fluids, or water I should say, than oxygen, you don't need that big of a difference. So it's a lot easier for it to equilibrate, basically diffuse normally, than, um, than oxygen. That's why with oxygen you have to have that giant concentration difference, you know, that, that, that very steep concentration gradient, because if you didn't, you would slow down the rate of diffusion if the if the if it was if the the concentration gradient was smaller, all right, be, due to oxygen's poor solubility in, in water, all right. So then basically, as so then so then this is so then essentially carbon dioxide will diffuse into alveoli, will exhale, and then that CO two will go out, right. Remember, not all the air in the alveoli are 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 it, or not all the air in the alveoli is, is breathed out. So there's going to be some carbon dioxide left trapped in there, right. And then basically, as blood then flows out of the out of the um, lungs. And then as we pump it out into the systemic circuit, the PCO2 in arteries is basically going to be 40. 40 millimeters of mercury, okay? And then basically as we circulate blood into systemic capillaries then, so in the blood it's gonna be 40 millimeters of mercury. And in the tissues, you know, the interstitial fluid of the tissues, it's going to be about 45 millimeters of mercury, okay? Partial pressure of about 45, 46, I mean, depending on what books you look at, but it's gonna be around 45, but you get the picture here, it's gonna be higher. Now, why is carbon dioxide, why is the partial pressure of CO2 higher in the tissues in this situation? Well, remember, cells are constantly burning substrates. And substrates, is just a, it's just a generic biochemistry term for fuel, okay? more specifically, organic fuel. Remember, the backbone of organic chemistry, or anything organic, is carbon. Unless it's a food industry, then the backbone of the organic food industry is to rip you off. But in chemistry, in chemistry, it's all about carbon. Now, as we break down organic fuels, you know, like uh, carbohydrates and fats and proteins, um, we, and basically, we're, as we break those carbon-based molecules apart, we're going to separate some carbon atoms from that. That carbon is going to combine with oxygen, and we're going to form CO2. So basically, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the cells is going to be even higher than that of the tissues, and that's going to force CO2 to move into the tissues. And then, so basically, these cells are unloading carbon dioxide into the interstitial fluids, and then as blood flows through capillaries with its lower partial pressure of CO2, that's going to favor the reabsorption of CO2 into the blood. And then we are going to carry that uh, basically to, you know, throughout the veins and then back to the, uh, back to the pulmonary circuit. So basically the PCO2 um, in veins is going to be about 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay. 
And that's ba- and that's all. I mean, and you guys, like I said before, you guys already know this because by the time you've gotten to this topic, you've talked about the cardiovascular system. You've talked about the differences between, excuse me, between arterial and venous blood. All right, the oxygen concentrations and CO two concentrations. All we're doing differently here is just adding numbers to the story. That's all we're doing. We're just putting numbers to the story. Don't forget those basic fundamental concepts of you know a higher amount of oxygen in arteries. Lower amount in veins, higher amount of CO2 in veins, lower amount in arteries. Like I said, all we just did here was just add numbers. We just made the story a lot more precise or a lot more specific. All right. Now it's important to understand this because because there, because pulmonary pathologies can obviously affect this process. You know, if, if we have um, a ventilation perfusion mismatching or it's not coupled like it's supposed to remember that the concept of ventilation perfusion coupling is that uh, is that is that breath rate and heart rate should match one another so the volume of blood pumping into the lungs uh, you know we match that with our breath rate right and there are certain pathologic conditions when you know we increase physiologic dead space and these values are disrupted, like with obstructive disorders like emphysema, for example, where you have a where where you your your residual volumes increased, you have a harder time getting rid of air, um, and if you have a harder time blowing air, you know, getting you know uh, getting air out and washing out the alveoli, you're going to accumulate more CO2 in there, and it's going to be harder to get that CO2 out of the blood. So basically, the differences in, in so basically the differences between these gases in the arteries and veins are going to be a lot different in unhealthy versus healthy people. And that's a topic I'd rather save for more of a pathophys uh, idea. But you get the concept by measuring the differences by understanding these numbers, how these numbers change throughout the systemic and 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 venous uh, or through uh, between arteries and veins. Um, basically, if if there's an alteration in our ability to get rid of these gases. Uh, basically, you can you can test that by doing what are called you know arterial blood gas tests, where you where you uh, essentially assess the um, you know the, the concentration of these gases in arteries, and then you compare that to that of venous blood, and then you can get some pretty valuable information. And let's just review some factors that that play a very large role in this. Factors that affect respiration or gas exchange. I mean, are we already? I, I think I, I think you guys are probably sick of hearing about partial pressure. But remember, if they remember when we're seeing a partial pressure difference, all we're saying is we've established a concentration gradient for these gases. That's all we're saying. Surface area. The bigger the surface area, all right. The the more basically you guys know this. The more we spread molecules out, all right. The more rapid the diffusion, because because on a more individual basis, it, you know the, these molecules are going to cross the cell membrane, and you couple that with a very very thin membrane, which I forgot to add to this. I don't know why. Uh, remember that 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 this that this exchange membrane is only about half a micron thick. All right, uh, you know basically where we undergo gas exchange with between uh, alveolar air sacs and pulmonary capillaries. And then pulmonary capillaries and alveolar um, air sacs are only about one and a half microns away from one another, micrometers away. So you put all this together, a big surface area, um, a close distance, and uh, thin membranes, that's going to result in rapid gas exchange. And that's a big reason why we only need to breathe in half a liter of air per breath, because we're good at getting the most out of uh, respiration with the air that we breathe in. All right, and then the weight and solubility of gases as well. You know the the partial pressure and presence of these, and essentially the how how well they mix in water. You know, so for example, factors that would affect this process is someone has pulmonary edema, where they're building up uh, excessive amounts of interstitial fluid. You know, tissue fluid in the lungs. Well, if you build up a bunch of tissue fluid in the lungs. All right, and uh, basically you build up a bunch of water in between the pulmonary capillaries and the uh, alveolar air sacs, now what did you just do to the rate of gas exchange? You slowed it down, right? Because you increased the distance between these, between alveolar air sacs and pulmonary capillaries, all right? If you damage the walls of the uh, alveolar air sacs, like, an, like you see in emphysema, uh, through primarily uh, years of chronic, you know, chronic uh, cigarette smoking, um, you know, firsthand smoking to be more specific, um, you know those are the, the you know the, the the alveoli that remain intact are going to be really stiff and really rigid, and and that's going to make it a lot harder for gases to move through there, and that's going to affect this process as well. That's why you know the, that's why doing those uh, arterial blood gas tests 
can tell you a lot about a patient. But that essentially is the concept of partial pressure and how concentrations of gases uh, change throughout the body. The next thing to talk about then is how we circulate carbon dioxide and oxygen throughout the body, and I will do that in the next video.